Hi, I'm Carl Franklin. In this episode of Blazer Train, I'm going to revisit two previous episodes. Episode 11, in which we learned how to build an API layer, and Episode 12, in which we learned how to use generics to create a repository interface for accessing data. We used that interface to make a generic data manager for use in our API controllers, and we also used it on the client to call into those APIs. Well, more than a quiet car full of passengers told me that you wanted to see a complete data access solution that married these two ideas together, targeting a real SQL database. Well, once we leave the station, I'm going to show you how to use Entity Framework Core to generate model classes and a DB context from an existing SQL database. I'll give you two generic API response classes that you can reuse for any controller endpoint that returns an entity or a list of entities. We'll make two repository interfaces, one with basic CRUD operations and another that adds a complex get method where you can pass an expression to select only the entities you want. You know, at this point, you might want to go get a cup of burnt coffee from the cafe car. Next, we'll make an Entity Framework repository class and build out an API controller that uses it to access and return the data. And once we get to the client station, we'll use the repository interface to build a generic API manager class that you can reuse for any entity. And we'll build a manager specifically for the controller we made, adding only a search method which is specific to that controller. Finally, We'll create a Blazor page with some simple CRUD UI, and then I'll come around and punch your tickets. And that's all coming up right now, right here on Blazor Train! So as promised, we're going to start with the database. Now, in the project Complete Data, which I've put together for you, zipped up, and you can download at blazertrain.com under this episode, episode 16. Uh, in here, I've got this notes.txt file, and this tells you everything you need to know in order to generate this database. So this is the Northwind database. I don't know, maybe you've heard of it, but we're going to create this in Visual Studio using the SQL uh, server object explorer right there under local db. We're going to add it to our databases. Right click on databases, add new database, call it Northwind. Now, of course, that's just a database, so we need a script to create the database and populate the tables and all that. Well, fortunately, if you go out to this link right here that I've put in the script, you can download the Northwind database, sample database script. And I'm just going to copy all of this into the clipboard and then execute it as a new query. So right click on Northwind, select new query, paste, and now you see the little green arrow in the corner of the query. Click that to execute. Meanwhile, while that's happening, I'll go on to my next step, which is to update the server project. And by the way, this is a WebAssembly project that's hosted in ASP.NET Core Server. So the complete data server is where the API controllers are gonna go. I want to use the following packages. So rather than go through the whole hassle of NuGet, I'm just gonna copy and paste this item group here and you can see what they are. So we have the, the one that was there before, which is required for Blazor server, Microsoft ASP.NET Core Components WebAssembly Server. Then we have Microsoft Entity Framework Core SQL Server and Entity Framework Core Tools. Uh, just get the latest versions of each if there are newer versions. So you might wanna go upgrade before you do anything else. And then we also need this Microsoft Visual Studio Web Code Generation Design because we're gonna do some scaffolding from this database to create all the EF stuff, okay? We don't need SQL Query 1, SQL anymore. We can get rid of that. We don't need to save it. Let's move on uh, to the next step, which is to do the scaffolding itself using this command 
at the .NET command line interface right here. So first of all, you need to be in the server directory. And for me, that's Blazor Train Complete Data Complete Data Server. In other words, the directory where this project is right here. And I'm just going to execute this by copying in, and then we'll just take a look at what it says. So .NET, that's our .NET command line uh, applet, EF for Entity Framework, DB Context Scaffold, and then in quotes, the connection string, and then Microsoft .entity framework uh, entity framework core .sql server, and now we tell it where we want the stuff to go. So the DB Context directory is going to make it's going to make a directory called data and for the models it'll create a folder called uh, models okay actually worked even though we got this warning about versions so let's go over and see what we got here yes we have a data folder now and a models folder the data folder has the northwind context right there the models folder has a model for every table and uh, every table relationship. So the first thing I want to do is move the models folder down into my shared project because the models need to be accessible not only from the server for the API controllers, but also from the client. So that's where they go. Now, one little caveat is when we move things around, we have to change the namespace on each one of these models. So I'm just going to press Control H to pull up a uh, search and replace. And you can see, well, maybe you can see, but we're going to change complete data server models to complete data shared models across the entire project. And I'll just say yes to that. And boom, those are all changed. So save all. And now we'll go to the Northwind context itself. And you can see this namespace for the models needs to be changed to shared as well. So we know where to find all these models. Now, one thing I do want to mention, if you go down here, there's an on configuring override because we don't have our connection string in a app settings.json file. So it's telling you, you probably want to do that. Move this to an app settings JSON file. So that's probably something you want to do in the real world. But for now, it's going to work just fine. All right, so that's it for my notes. Now I can pick up uh, how to build this application or how I built this application. And I like to do this because uh, it it's a little bit more believable if you take something that has nothing and you learn what you need to do rather than just going and visiting all the things that I've already done. Does that make sense? I hope so. All right. So the next thing we're going to do is add to the models folder a couple of classes that I built for you that can be used generically for any entity to return entities from an API controller. Okay, so the first one is for a single entity and the second one is for a list of those entities. And we're going to use generics. All right, so this one's going to be called API Entity Response. So rather than just returning a single entity, I want some more information around it. Did the operation succeed or not? And if it didn't succeed, I want a list of error messages. Usually there's only one error message, but if there's more, I want to know why. And then finally, the data itself is the entity. So we're passing in the entity, let's say it's customers, because actually we're going to create the data all around the customers table today. So we would pass in customers as the entity type. So that means we're going to return data is going to be a customer's record. So the next one we'll do is for a list. And this is API list of entity response. All right, again, using the generic T entity, now we're returning data as an I enumerable of T entity. So a list of customers, all right? The cool thing about this is the generics. So you can reuse these 
endpoint types for any type of entity that you want. All right, now we need some interfaces for our repository. The repository is going to be an interface for CRUD operations. And we can use this repository to make a data manager for Entity Framework and also a manager for APIs on the client side. So I repository. So take a look at this. So we have two deletes, one that takes the entity, one that takes the primary key as an object. Um, one thing you might be aware of here is if you have compound keys. In other words, if you've got a table that where the primary key is two foreign keys together, this isn't going to work. So I'm working on that. Get back to me later. So now we have one get all that takes uh, that returns in a list of those entities, and get by ID again takes the primary key, returns the entity. Uh, and then another one for insert and another one for update. So basic CRUD stuff. Now we're going to build on that and add the ability to use an expression for a get. So rather than just get all or get one, I want to search. I want to say get where the first name includes this or the last name includes that or the postal code equals this. Whatever it is, you can specify an expression on the get. This will not be used at the API level because it's difficult to take that expression and package it up and send it to an API controller, but it is very useful uh, as a data manager. So we're going to call this one I repository generic get. So this is where the magic is. It's, it takes a filter as an expression, like this is your where clause, and the properties that are in the where clause get, in, uh, get uh, passed in this string, and then your order by. So it's a way to use link to pull out specific records from the database or from whatever uh, the repository is. All right, now we're going to use this guy to create in the server an entity framework repository. So this one's going to be called repository EF. Again, you can name these however you want. This is just for my demo. This is what I called it. So repository EF is a class, not an in, uh, interface. And this uh, builds on the iRepository generic get. It uses that interface, passing a data context as well as an entity. So we could create a customer's repository, or we could create a orders repository, whatever it is. And now you can uh, see what's going on here. We get the data context in the constructor, and we've got our deletes which uses the data context. And we have the generic get with the expression and the, the filter and, and all of that goodness right there. And this is the code that we were showing in uh, episode 12. Uh, Mateus was showing this with me, Mateus Carvalho. So this is a way to use that repository with the entity framework, right? And that's exactly what we're doing here. We can reuse this for any entity that we want. All right, next we're going to add some stuff to start up here in the services. We need to add the Northwind context, which is our DB context first. And then we have to add each repository as well. So we're only having, we're only creating one here from customers. Now notice this. Add transient. Well, I know about add scoped is one instance per user. Add singleton, which is one instance shared among all users. Why add transient? Well, the reason is we don't want the DB context sticking around in between calls. Okay, we want it to go away because if it does stick around, it is by default tracking all the entities that get. Uh, that go through it. And we don't want to do that. In, in a web scenario, you don't want to track entities, at least 
it's been my experience that you don't want to try. There isn't any reason to track entities in a web scenario. So that's why transient. Transient means that you you use them once in a controller, and then when that goes away, the whatever it is that we're adding goes away as well. Just like as if it was a module level variable, except that it's getting injected. Okay. Now let's do the controller. Right click on controllers, and I'm going to add customers controller. Here's the customers controller. So here we're injecting a repository EF of customers with the Northwind context. And there it is right there. Now we've got our get, get all. And you can notice that we're using a task. We made them async, a task of action result of API list of entity response customers. So it's quite a bit packed in there. But essentially, all we want to do is return, uh, you know, an action result, which is going to be OK, status code or whatever, of this API list of entity response. Uh, if we get a OK, success equals true, data equals result. Now, it's either going to be something or nothing. So that's why we're using a try catch here. If we have a problem, we're going to log the exception and just return 500. Same with the other ones. We're using the same pattern. In this case, we're searching by customer ID, right? And we know it's customer ID because this is a customer's controller. So there's a chance that the result's going to come back null because you might be searching on a customer ID that doesn't exist. We're still going to return OK if it's null, but success is going to be false, and our error message is going to say customer not found. The data is going to be null. Right, So it was successful. The API call was successful. It's just that our query didn't return any result. So here's one called search by contact name. And you can see that I did the routing attribute here at the top. Right, I mapped contact name to my string contact name. And I'm requiring the string search by contact name after that. So this is where we're using that uh, special get, right? Customers manager dot get passing x, where x contact name to lower contains contact name to lower, all right? And that's going to either return null, or it's going to return an i enumerable of customers, right? So if we get something back, we're going to say OK, pass the result. Otherwise, we're going to say, OK, but success is false, error messages, customers not found. Same as before. Now, the post is for adding a customer. So this is essentially add customer. Passing the customer as an entity, and I'm calling uh, customer manager insert, passing the customer. Now I want to see if it's there. So I'm going to use customer manager get on the customer ID. And if it's not null, everything's cool, success is true, and I'm actually going to return the entity that we added because now it's got a primary key or whatever, okay? Otherwise, I'm gonna return okay, success is false, and the error message couldn't find customer after adding it. I don't think that this would ever happen. More, You're more likely to get an exception, but just in case, there you go. So the put is for updates. So this is updating a customer. And everything else is exactly the same. Returning the result if we get one, otherwise null. And here's our delete and by customer ID. So the first thing we're doing is getting the customer, making sure it's there. And of course, that returns a list. Right. So if the list is not null, then we're pulling the first one off of that. That's our customer, and we're going to delete it. And if it's successful, we're going to return OK. Another thing that we could return here is no content. It's up to you. No content is typically used for deletes, but OK is perfectly acceptable. 
So that is our controller using the manager to access the database with Entity Framework. All right, we've pulled into the client station. So at the client uh, or the app itself, I'm gonna add a folder called services and I'm gonna add an API repository class. Now this is a class that we can reuse for any entity. And this has got all the CRUD stuff on it. Oh, and it's also got an error because I'm using Newtonsoft JSON and we have to add that package. So I'll install Newtonsoft JSON. Everybody be happy. Okay, so check this out. This is an API repository of entity, right? So we'll create one for customers, which uses iRepository of entity, all right? And I've also got a couple of things here. I've got a controller name and a primary key name. And we're gonna need that in order to make this generic, you'll see. So when we create one of these, right? We're passing the HTTP client, the controller name, and the primary key name. Now check out get all. So this is a typical HTTP request to an API. So we're just calling the controller name. We're gonna ensure a successful status code. In other words, if the code comes back with an error, anything but a 200, uh, it's going to throw an exception. So we're gonna read the body from the response, read as string async, and then we're going to deserialize that as an API list of entity response of T entity, remember? T entity, generic. Okay, and if the response is successful, we'll return the data. Otherwise, I wanna return a new list. And this is important, I think, at the API call layer because dealing with nulls in the UI is a real pain. So it's so much easier if it just comes back as an empty list, right? Then the user knows there's nothing there, everything's cool. But dealing with nulls is certainly a, an issue in the UI. So let's move down to get by ID. All right, now the URL is gonna be the controller name plus the argument. The argument is an HTML encoded version of the ID as a string. Now typically, primary keys are either strings or ints, right? A, a GUID is a string. So it's either a GUID or an int or a string. You don't usually have complex types. So the rest of this is exactly the same as you would expect except now we're using API entity response instead of API list of entity response. We're just returning a single entity. Um, all the rest of these are pretty much the same idea. Here we're inserting the controller name we're posting as JSON, reading the result. We're updating. And don't you like how easy this is? Controller name right there. Now, when, when do we need this primary key name? Well, right here in the delete. Check this out. If I have an entity to delete, I'm going to have to pass the primary key. So to get that, I'm using a little reflection to get the primary key property value into this variable. And I'm going to HTML encode that in my arg and pass that as the argument to delete. Tricky. And then, of course, if we're passing the actual uh, ID to delete, then we're just going to pass that up. Oh, and I noticed I didn't use my web utility HTML encode right there. Definitely want to do that. It just makes sense, folks. So there you go. There's our generic API repository. Now let's create a customer manager from that that adds the ability to search, but we won't have to reproduce all this CRUD stuff. So I'm gonna go to services and I'm gonna add a customer manager class. So this is the magic here. 
customer manager is going to inherit API repository of customers. We've got our HTTP client here because we've got a search by contact name. We have to use it. All right. But we're initializing this API repository of customers passing in, you remember, the controller name and the primary key name. So now all the CRUD stuff can happen, no sweat, all the basic stuff. But since this is for customers, I'm ad adding this method right here, which returns in the I enumerable of customers, search by contact name. Okay, now let's get to the UI. But first we have to add customer manager as a scoped service to the client. And we also need to add these using statements to imports user. Now we can get to our UI. All right, I'm going to run it and then we'll come back and visit the code. So I bumped up the font so you folks in the back of the car can see. All right, so we've got our list of customers, and this is the contact name that we're showing. And if I click on any one of these, I'm going to retrieve that by ID and pull back the record. And now I've bound to the contact name. I can make a change to the name and update. Updates here. All right, we went to the API, we updated the record, and then we updated it in our list as well. If I try to delete a record that's in the database, we're going to get this. Could not delete customer, and it's because of the constraints that are in the database. But let's I'm going to add myself as a customer. And you can see that I've been added down to the bottom here. And I'll make a change to myself so that we know it works, and I can delete this guy, no problem. I can also exercise that search function if I just do something like AR. Now this is the list of customers where the name contains AR. How about Z? Yeah, turns out there are quite a few with Z. Now let's just do something that I know isn't there, and we get an empty list. All right. Good stuff. All right, now let's take a look at what this UI does, starting with, you guessed it, on initialized async. So right when we create this page from the get-go, we're calling get all customers. What is get all customers? exactly what you think it is. I have a customer manager with a get all method. And that is, guess what, injected. There it is, customer manager. Now in terms of the variables that I have defined here, I've got customers, which is a list of customers. I've got customer, which is the selected customer. Search name, which I've bound my search text box to and an error message, which is something that I show if there's a problem. So let's go to the top here. If customers is not null, we're going to add this search by name input box. And on click, we're going to call search. I'll get to that in a second. Uh, then I have a get all customers button, show all. Woo! And now I have a, a function, can I add a customer? Uh, and that's going to return a Boolean. Now, I do that because add customer is pretty much hard-coded, right? I didn't want to do a whole form to fill out all the stuff for a customer. So I just add myself and some junky data. The customer ID is CFUSA, right? So if I tried to add the customer twice, the first time it's going to go through, Second time, it's not going to be able to add because there's already a record in the database with that primary key. So that's why I have this, can I add a customer? And it just does a little bit of link to see if that customer exists in customers. And if it does, I'm returning false. All right, so next, we have a select, which is our list box. 
and I'm just going through each customer. The value is the customer ID. What we show is the contact name. And when I click on one, I'm going to customer selected. So customer selected, it would be easy for me to pull it out of the local customers, but I want to exercise the API. So that's why I'm pulling it from the customer manager, get by ID. All right, so now customer is either gonna be null or it's going to be something. Go back up here. So if the customer is not null, then I have the update button and an input bound to the contact name, all right? And I have a delete button. So let's look at update customer. In update customer, I'm gonna pull the customer out of my customers list, and I'm gonna get the index of it, because this is an easy way for me to update it later. So then I update it with the customer manager, and I get the updated version back here, and if it's not null, then I replace the customer's record in the customer's list with what I've updated. All right, search. So this happens when I click the search button. I'm going to come down in here and search by contact name with the customer manager. If I get anything back, I'm going to return the list of customers. Otherwise, I'm going to uh, create a new list of customers and say that there's no matching customers. The only thing left maybe is the details of add customer. I create the customer and then I call insert and if the result is not null, then I add that result to the customers and I set the customer, in other words, the selected customer to result. And that's it. Here's a complete solution from the repository pattern to the API, to the controllers, to any framework with a generic data manager. Back to you in the studio, Carl. Hey, how about that, huh? Whoa, whoa. You know, I noticed that the quiet car isn't so quiet right now. Don't make me pull over. Hey, thanks for riding the rails with me today. This is where I jump off. I'll see you next time. Place a train.